Hello, and welcome to the official podcast of the 2024 International Fuel Ethanol Workshop and Expo, or FEW for short. I'm your host, Danielle Pikarski, and I am excited to have our first guest of the year on the podcast today. We are joined by Dylan Hart, Geosystems Engineer at Black and Veatch. At FEW, Dylan is presenting on a panel titled An Exploration of the Methodologies for Determining Well Site Viability for CCS Projects. This panel will take place at 8.30 a.m. on the morning of Monday, June 10th, and Dylan will be presenting on on-site screening for carbon sequestration injection wells. So without further ado, welcome to the podcast, Dylan. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, Danielle. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here and honored to be the, the first guest on the podcast. Of course, we're excited to have you. So let's get into your presentation, Dylan. Can you walk us through the process of site screening and evaluation of reservoirs for potential CO2 storage from the initial assessment to site-specific characterization? Sure. So I'll come at this from sort of a geologic perspective. And, and one of the first things we do in, in reservoir screening is identifying a, a geologic reservoir that has the capability to act as a permanent storage for CO2 sequestration and to, to keep it in place. Obviously, there's a lot of other project level factors like distances from the CO2 source emitter locations to those injection sites, the cost to construct carbon capture systems and transport, and then the injection wells themselves, the regulatory requirements and, and all of those things. But purely from the, the reservoir screening standpoint, we start with a geologic screening and evaluation for reservoirs using an assessment of geologic data to identify the characteristics of those reservoirs, like things for you know appropriate lithology and adequate depth and, and thickness of those formations with confining zones surrounding that storage zone, because you, you need that storage zone to have the capability to inject and distribute the injected CO2 fluid away from, from the well bore and then contain it within in some characterized space. So the site-specific data collection methods after performing sort of a desktop study to look at those things and identify the right lithology and the right geologic basin and, and some of the higher level aspects, which we can get into a little bit more. But, but once you get through that period and identify a site, then you kind of move into the site-specific data collection, which can start on the surface with things like seismic surveys to identify larger areas of, of the basin. And then we go in and collect data from the subsurface by drilling exploratory wells, collecting rock core samples, geophysical tools to, to look at physical properties of the reservoir, their density and electrical resistivity and other geochemical and mineralogical makeup. The reason we do all these things is it comes back to ensuring protection of, of underground sources of drinking water and the underground injection control program under the Clean Water Act, which, which dictates the rules of the road of, of how we have to characterize these things in order to safely implement this approach. So you, you start broad and then come all the way down to those finer details and collect real information from the subsurface once you get close to actually constructing a well and, and doing those site-specific things. So what are some key findings from applying the site characterization process to specific areas like the U.S. Gulf Coast or coastal plains? And how do these findings inform uh, potential CO2 storage capabilities? Yeah, so, so there's some good news there. I think we have great findings from the start of that process and all of the regional scale characterization. We don't have to start from scratch. A lot of that work has already been done. There's a lot of publicly funded research that goes back decades from agencies like the Department of Energy and the U.S. Geological Survey. Lots of universities have been working on you know more localized information around their areas. One, for instance, the Gulf Coast Carbon Center 
at the, the Bureau of Economic Geology here at the University of Texas at Austin. And there's my obligatory shout out to my Longhorns, Hookum. <laughs> These researchers have, have done a great job of producing maps and models that, that identify the most easily accessible regions in the US onshore and offshore that contain the, the largest capacity of reservoir rock that can hold CO2 in, in saline aquifers and in other potential storage reservoirs. They've identified the specific units and the boundaries of those units. And in, in a lot of cases, the thickness and, and a lot of the regional characterization that's needed to really springboard into the next steps of site-specific characterization. So that's a big one that those data sets exist and are publicly available for anybody who wants to look into siting a, a CCS project. Some of those large scale screening assessments have found really positive results that, hey, we looked at all of the sedimentary basins across the US and, and they've identified somewhere in the realm of like 3000 gigaton of CO2 storage capacity. Uh, to put that in some context, that's like 500 years of storage. If we were to capture all of our annual emissions in the US, which are about five and a half gigatons per year kind of put those numbers in more perspective, we can say, hey, what if we can capture 90% of our annual emissions every year? Well, I think based on a lot of these data and the, and the screening that we've done and, and what the information that the Gulf Coast Carbon Center and USGS and others have found is that we can do that and it would take somewhere in the realm of 2,500 to 5,000 injection wells to handle that sort of permanent storage. And those maybe take that, it could be double that, triple that, but you know, it's, it's in that ballpark of a few thousand injection wells that could handle basically all of our emissions in, in the U.S. And, and that's a very achievable goal. We've got hundreds of thousands of existing injection wells uh, in the U.S. for other purposes, for industrial waste disposal and, and oil and gas related work. So that's a very achievable goal is, is what we found. We, we can do this if we are putting the right resources to it. There's been a lot of site-specific characterization work in the U.S. Gulf Coast as a lot of projects are progressing to drilling wells and getting their Class 6 uh, injection well permits. We're seeing that a lot of the wells in the Gulf Coast, which is some of the best thick sand deposits that are you know really good at accepting large quantities of, of CO2, and, and some of those wells can accept well over a million metric tons of CO2 per year, some up to two in, in certain reservoirs and certain wells. And that can be expanded with various well construction practices of, of going horizontal and, and, and other you know more complex well construction. But even with simple vertical wells, a lot of, of sites are seeing you know really good preliminary results from, from their characterization efforts. So we're starting to see a lot of those projects develop and move toward construction. And hopefully we'll be able to get some confirmation of you know the modeled results here in the next you know couple of years and start seeing these projects go to operation. Yes, very interesting stuff. Okay. So to take a step beyond CO2 storage, how does site screening take into account not only geological feasibility, but also uh, social data, sensitive areas, population centers, and any existing infrastructure to help optimize project development? Yeah, great, great question. We have to take into account so many other characteristics. It could be that, yeah, the best place to drill a well is smack dab in the middle of downtown Houston, and that's just not going to work. <laughs> so we have to take into account, you know, population centers, like you said, we're, we're using geospatial analysis, looking at land use of where, you know, areas are and where existing oil and gas infrastructure is, which is sort of a tricky consideration to make because in one instance areas with a lot of oil and gas activity have well characterized subsurface because they've poked a lot of holes out there and they've collected a lot of data but one of the most important things we have to consider when siting that well is the risk of leakage through old abandoned wells they call them artificial penetrations which is basically just holes in the ground other wells that have been drilled or plugged and abandoned or other existing wells that actually penetrate through the target formation you're looking at. So we want to site well locations away from those or with the, the lowest density of those artificial penetrations as we can. We're also taking into account, like I said, the land use of, of hey, who's who's here? Who, who owns the property around us? Is it private land? Is it public land? 
Are we dealing with how many entities, how many agencies on public lands are we going to have to deal with to get the rights to the, the poor space in order to develop this project? We're looking at environmental social justice screening, too, of where are sensitive receptor places that are already socioeconomically disadvantaged that we're, we're not making situations worse. We're putting these projects and the jobs that they provide in places that need them and that are acceptable to them. So we use things like the EPA, ESJ, or, or ESG screening tool to evaluate some of these factors. We expand that geospatial analysis to, to land use and parcel ownership and distance to and from existing infrastructure and utilities. We need power supply for these projects. So all of these things kind of have to be overlaid to find the kind of a Goldilocks zone of a sweet spot and a, a path of least resistance to siting a well in an optimized location. So it's it's a lot of layering geospatial areas and conversations with communities and and engaging with the agencies early on to make sure we understand all of those factors and the current and planned future land uses for these areas before we go out there drilling a well and, and pumping stuff down a hole. <laughs> So one last question I have for you here, Dylan, as the demand for CO2 storage grows, what new methods or advancements in resource evaluation might be necessary to effectively evaluate uh, prospective reservoirs for the sequestration of CO2? Sure. So a lot of folks may not be familiar with you know, the terminology of resource evaluation as it relates to subsurface reservoir resources that are evaluated in a very specific way. I and mean, this is the, the language of, of reservoir engineers and the financial folks and staff behind deciding how much this asset is worth based on production. And so that's sort of the corollary that we're talking about too. Of, how do we evaluate the value of a CO2 resource or a CO2 sequestration reservoir resource in terms of its value of the product it's providing to society, which in this case is reducing CO2 emissions from the atmosphere. And the, the market for that is valued in tax credits of tons of CO2 removed from circulation. So we can use that structure of resource evaluation in which the Society of Petroleum Engineers, the, the SPE, has a has a really good you know kind of standard for that and there's some ASTM standards from that from independent agencies that develop these that we need to adapt and some of this work has been done the SPE has has published a, a storage reservoir management system that's based on on that similar work and it's a good start for evaluating CO2 storage valuation and it builds off of decades of all of that work. However, we, we need experience from real projects that have been financed and from banking and, and lenders that are that are evaluating storage assets and that are actually valuing their market potential. And we just haven't gotten there yet with, with real precedent and real projects because storage hubs of the scale we're talking about now and that are happening just simply haven't been developed previously. And, and so we, we don't know exactly how to quantify the, the revenue streams, the operating costs, the risks, the long-term liability. There's a little bit of trepidation in the market of who's going to do this first and, and get the real experience. So I think some of those things will work themselves out with time. A lot of these projects are moving forward and we'll start to, to see some more progress in that area. Well, thank you, Dylan. For those who would like to hear more from Dylan, make sure to tune in to his panel, an exploration of the methodologies for determining well site viability for CCS projects at 8.30 a.m. Monday morning on June 10th. Thank you again for joining us today. It was great to chat with you, and I look forward to seeing you at FEW next month. Thanks, Danielle. Yeah, thanks for, for listening to me. I could talk about stuff all day. So I'm excited to, to have a platform at SEW and see everybody there. Yes, and our crew at BBI is certainly looking forward to seeing everyone in Minneapolis next month. So if you are interested in attending or learning more about the conference, visit few.bbiconferences.com for more information. Thank you for listening, and we will talk to you more on the next International Fuel Ethanol Workshop podcast.
Until then.